Welcome to Audiovisual Cultures, the podcast attached to the broader ABC educational project. I'm your host, Paula Blair. Thanks for finding us, downloading and listening. This edition is a post-viewing discussion between me and film historian Andrew Scheel about Denny Villeneuve's 2016 film Arrival. Before settling into that, a reminder that you can get in touch via email on audiovisualcultures at gmail.com with queries or if you'd like to be a guest speaker at some point. At the time of this recording, I'm still designing and populating the Audiovisual Cultures website, which aims to facilitate and supplement lifelong learning learning in a range of arts and humanities study areas. The website hasn't yet launched but is under construction. To help me get it up and running, please consider pledging a monthly subscription via patreon.com forward slash PEA Blair, where you can also access videos, blogs, links to publications and video transcripts, all of which are building towards populating the website. I'm a film scholar, so film and cinema dominate discussions as we get up and running. In the long run, the objective is to be as diverse and inclusive and canon-breaking as possible. I'm all about breaking down boundaries and disrupting hard borders, so I hope you'll join me for that. And I hope you enjoy the following discussion. So, Dr Blair, what did we just watch? We just watched Arrival, and this is a film we saw in the cinema last year when it came out, and you bought the DVD quite a while ago, and we yeah. haven't got round to watching it, partly because I think for months we just needed to watch fun, light stuff, and we knew that it's going to be hard going, <clears throat> even though we've seen it before, it's still a highly emotive film and it's dealing with quite a lot of heavy stuff as well as being enjoyable for its incredible artistry in many ways. I think it's appropriate that we've deliberately re-watched a film we saw in cinemas because we haven't done that yet. On these recordings. On these, yeah, on these recordings. <laughs> I think we do, that, we do it all the time um, so that we can keep things mixed up and I must say that having found the original watch quite an intense experience, yeah. this was less intense of course because I knew it was going to happen but mm. also it just seemed to move faster this time around yeah. and it was because the intensity of watching it first time around was derived at least in part from about only really understanding about half of what was going on exactly. because the film was deliberately mm-hmm. misleading its implied viewer for something like 75% of its total I time I think that's a, yeah. an interesting point in itself because you could say that it's deliberately misleading and that's quite a negative connotation to say that but mm. you have to rethink language including film language for the film to click into place and make sense so the film has a palindromic structure Uh so when you unlock a different way of thinking about film language the way you so there's all these different approaches to language all different kinds of language so it's only misleading because the narrative conventions from I would say largely western cinema that we're used to have a certain structure and that film is not structured in that way within its own rules it's not misleading at all just that we only learn those rules by watching the film exactly so the film is itself initially speaking its language in such a way that its viewer is going to misunderstand it exactly yeah. uh, and only later on provides the little content cues necessary to figure mm-hmm. out that its language is different from the one we've yeah. learned and I suppose I'm into the way that cinema narrates time consulting my notes I, I wondered for a moment oh, and of course we're going to be spouting spoilers yes I'm putting warnings on the comments for everything that these discussions are largely analytical so you need to have seen the film if you don't want spoilers it's not a review <laughs> <laughs> yeah we don't do <laughs> reviews. It's only very <laughs> occasional that we'll gush about something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in our professional lives, we get few opportunities to state what we thought about the quality of a piece of work. Yeah. And so this is one of those Because we don't do that. We're very particular academics about being as objective as possible in our work. But in something like this, you're going to say your opinion every now and again. Yeah. So. And, of course, it's because we both like it that mm. I bought it in DVD and that we've just rewatched it. Okay, so, time. 
flashbacks and flash forwards. First thing to distinguish is a flashback as a convention in cinema is associated with a character in the story space remembering something. It's not the equivalent of a narrator in prose fiction going five days earlier, blah blah blah. It's not the equivalent of the film taking us back in time, it's the equivalent of in the ongoing story now, a character recollecting their memory of something that happened in the past. So what we're actually seeing is a memory, a recollected memory, not the actual past. So the flashback convention, uh, what that means is that if a film is showing you something which is clearly out of Mm -hmm. chronological order, Mm -hmm. or if it's showing you starkly discrepant shot A, shot B, shot C, shot D patterns, it will only be apparent that this is a flashback if there's some indication that there's a character doing some remembering. So when Louise Banks started to remember Amy Adams' character, when she started to remember, in inverted commas, remember her daughter Hannah in little scraps, that started after the first major breakthrough with the heptapods, and it's the one where she'd taken off her hazmat suit. And so there was a moment of her stopping, looking rather disturbed, crouching over, and then a graphically very dissimilar shot with much shallower depth of field, so lots of out of focus element of Hannah. And so there's a clear conventionalised grammar saying Mm -hmm. this is a character doing some remembering. Those little specks that we were getting through roughly the middle half of the film very clearly denoted to be flashbacks by the form. And only as we were getting towards the end of them did the content start to indicate that that kind of happened in the past Mm -hmm. because Hannah knew about the heptapod. Now, what about the beginning bit of the film? Because for the first five minutes of the film, we have a quick rampage through Mm -hmm. what seems to be the ten years leading up Mm -hmm. to the day when the uh, heptapods arrive, which includes the growing up and then the illness and then Hannah dying. Why does that seem to be happening before the heptapods arrive, where actually we find out later on that it happens after the heptapods arrive, it happens after the heptapods leave even. Why does it seem to be the case? Because some sort of cue that goes here's a character remembering something, is absent entirely. Mm -hmm. So that aspect of film grammar, that formal aspect Mm -hmm. of film grammar, is absent at the beginning. And so what did you and I both assume when we saw it in cinemas? What did you and I both, again, trying to forget what we knew about the film? Does the film actually rely on its viewers' thinking at the beginning Mm -hmm. for its later reversal to make sense? We thought that the order in which we were shown things was the order in which they happened. So there's two existing conventions with cinema. One is much more of a ritualised one, it's the flashback, and the other one seems to be a bit more of an instinctive one. It's simply, we're seeing a bit of time happening, and then we're seeing another bit of time happening, and there's no indication whether piece of time B happens before or after A, so we just assume that it happens after. That seems to be the kind of default assumption. So this film, Denis Villeneuve, who is not one of those big star directors who's always talking about his films, and the making of stuff that we've seen has him very meek and very quiet and very willing to credit the talents of those working around him but this is somebody who really understands the formal behaviour of the medium that he's working in mm-hmm. as well as the conventionalised nature of that behaviour such that it can be changed even though what you have to engage in in order to change it is a really brute force jamming of the system a kind of blatant hey look you know what you thought and you know what we constantly prompted you to think flip that completely on its head now and that has to be in tune with a learning by the characters that time Time isn't what they think it is. Mm. So there has to be a big kind of content cue in the story space to go, it's time for you to entertain the possibility that film language could be significantly different. Which brings us on to what I think is not the principal conceit of this film, but I think it's the second conceit of the film, which is, isn't it cool that science teaches us that things that seem common sense are actually assumptions that it might not be appropriate to always make? So the basic thing that the linguists quickly work out is that the noises that these heptapods are making are not speech. They're just rumblings. Well, that's it, because the human privilege is what the human does, and it's interesting when you've got the caged bird who is there to test atmosphere, but it's chirping away, and we decide that birds do not have language because their chirps, there are certain sounds that birds make that will mean certain things, but we don't maybe study enough what their head movements mean, or Mm -hmm. what their leg movements, or what they do with their wings. Those physical aspects of what they do, we have developed speech and language so that's what we have decided is primary communication and this film reminds us and actually because we privilege verbal speech and people who do not possess verbal speech for whatever reason whether they've had a stroke or they've never been able to speak or whatever it is that prevents them from accessing that we decide that they cannot communicate we privilege this manner of speaking so we have to remember to 
open our minds out to other modes of communication. And again, with film language, I was thinking about silent cinema because the heptapods are behind the screen, basically, and they're moving. It's physical movements and shapes that they make. It's images that they make. That's the mode of communication. And that's essentially what silent cinema was. And of course, silent cinema wasn't silent. It was noisy because there was other Mm. stuff going on with it and there's visual sound. These heptapods are noisy and they occupy a space that makes noise, but that noise isn't communicating anything. And it's not communicating things in language. Cinema is often called the medium that learned to talk. It learned to communicate. Well, it already did. It already had methods of communication which it had been forced to adopt. And because he, it had no sound element. Yeah. And, and Villeneuve and the team there at you and the short story that the film's based on, they tap into those different modes of communication. Again, cinema is a different mode of communication. We can communicate through cinema without verbal language very easily, actually, yeah. because we learn its codes, we learn what it does. So if it's misleading, it's because we have a fixed notion of what editing is and what narrative structure is, and we have to unfix those the way that that Louise Banks has to unfix language and again that idea of time and memory we have to disrupt how humans experience time and space time we have a very linear understanding of it because our lives are linear it begins and it ends this story ends as it begins and begins as it ends like the palindrome one thing we must do during this discussion is have a quick look on the storycurves.com website to see if they've done Arrival Mm. because they've done a lot of non-linear films Mm -hmm. but this movie too recent for them and the Back to the Future Mm. 2 diagram. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. It's a bit unfortunate that we're stuck here with a purely sonic medium, which prevents us from using the diagrams which you need to iterate how this film works. So I haven't read Ted Chiang's no. uh, short story. It's called Story of Your Life. Either it's a long short story or it's a novella. This is quite a science fiction thing. From what I've read but, about it, because I haven't read it either, but I'm quite keen to, but from what I've read about it, it's not necessarily that long, but it's incredibly dense and complex. Mm. Well, let's park on the concept of science fiction mm-hmm. for a moment. There's rival definitions of science fiction, but the one that I'm most fond of is one which is based on fields of science which have newly opened up. So things which are speculative mm-hmm. in that they speculate about whole possibilities we hadn't imagined 30 years ago, but they speculate on the basis of recent discoveries. So this is somebody who's speculating about possibilities that have been revealed by linguistics and possibilities that have been revealed by physics as well, such as the idea that being able to understand the concept of time... uh, This is a bit you can cut out. Timey-wimey things. (laughs) Um, I was learning about it today. It's it's what's called the double slit experiment. When you fire particles through two slits, you get a wave pattern on a screen on the other side, but it happens even when you fire just one particle through, suggesting that the particle passes through both slits at the same time. So that particle is actually in two places at once which suggests that at the quantum level, our understanding of space and time doesn't apply. And so just going, hey, maybe there might be a possibility that you can get to a degree of of understanding of the universe where that just becomes your normal understanding of space Mm. and time. On the short story, I just read a quick plot description of the short story, and it seems to be very similar Mm. to this. And it has the same roughly circular structure as well. And what we may have here is one of those instances when an adaptation translates aspects of the original into the destination medium with an understanding of the destination medium that means that things that need to be changed are changed and things that don't need to be changed aren't. So the short story starts on the day that Banks conceives her daughter. So she makes the decision to get pregnant, knowing that the daughter will die of this very rare Mm. disease. And so it's the short story is circular because it's then narrated in a series of mm-hmm. flash forwards and flashbacks and then it ends with her explaining why she's made that decision and we get roughly the same thing with the film just not with those particular uh, moments it's the entire life of Hannah in a rather yes. concatenated form that we get just on the narrative voice and narration Ian Donnelly's character in the film takes that on for a short time yes um, and it, mm. so it doesn't last very long and it's about the way and it's about how they actually started to unlock this and mm. her work, really. Yeah, it's something like it's a diary that he seems to be keeping, uh-huh. or it's a re- later rewriting of a diary that he yeah, kept during the first 
few weeks of this research It seems project. fairly close in proximity in terms of time. Just, just thought it was worth raising if you're trying to look at what or who is the narrator of the film, what's the narrative point of view of the film. His voice takes on a lot, like there's a voiceover from him for a short time. I was thinking one of those things that marks it out as being an adaptation is that it does that thing of having a narrator speaking at the beginning and then yeah. that narrator disappears as if what the screenwriters thought was hey, we've really got to use this really quite juicy uh, uh-huh. narrator from the original prose and yet after about two or three days of writing the script they go, we need to just stop this mm-hmm. after a little bit so let's have that fine, lovely, juicy narrator let's yes, have that for the then. first four minutes mm-hmm. and then we stop mm-hmm. and then hand over to the filmic process to be the narrator mm-hmm. So we've got that initial stuff from Louise at the beginning, and then we've got that blob in the middle, which is one of those, we're just going to skip forward a few weeks kind of um, things that we often get, which is Donnelly's narration. And then at the end we get very abstract, just Louise speaking to herself, maybe not contemporary to when we're seeing her, so maybe it is just what she's thinking at that point, maybe it's not. So we get one of those kind of telltale hallmarks that it is Mm -hmm. adapted from prose. And I think done in such a way that completely serves the overall arc. There's some stylistic stuff that I just want to do my usual rampage through Mm -hmm. because it's this thing, I I think perhaps it might be called the Cloverfield Principle, which is where have CGI elements in your story space, but have them either photographed by diegetic cameras Mm -hmm. so that they're composited into busy shots, into shaky shots. They're composited They're out of focus, Mm -hmm. way off in the distance. Or have them in the shots which I like to call the articulating shots, as in the ones which are taken by the camera that gives us the story space. Mm. So not by cameras in the story space, but by the, the narrating camera, but narrating is not the right word, the articulating, the story space the describing camera. camera. Yeah, the, the <laughs> non diegetic camera. Have them in those shots, but have that camera behave similarly to diegetic cameras. So have it let things be out of focus, yes, uh-huh. have it move quite frantically. That one scene where... Louise is out in the field Mm -hmm. and she's having a crisis and she's kind of walking back and forth and there's relatively shaky handheld camera and for most of the two or three shots the ship's in the background Mm -hmm. and it's out of focus Mm -hmm. and that's something which was done in post-production the ship was just put into this background and it was integrated such that as far as the film's concerned these are unremarkable objects in the story space it's there, it's in the background it's there but it's unimposing it's just... Yeah, it's there. And yet you've got the contrast with all the news programmes calling it a crisis, alien yeah. crisis, and they're just yeah. sitting there. They're not doing anything. Yeah. And so I suppose the, the film is going, these characters have no reason to be scared. And then yeah. the contrast between that message and the characters all being so scared, uh-huh. even including Banks, because it is an overwhelming experience for her. Yeah, yeah. And Donnelly too, you know, he's, he has that pratfall early on. So he, even he, who's quite childishly excited about the entire thing, still finds it quite scary. But it's okay. the paranoia that rises. I think there's probably a lot to go into about the military as well in a bit. Military time, I was thinking, actually. Uh-huh. There's a, this clash between this multilateral way of thinking about time from the aliens and the time span that Louise needs to crack them. But there's mm. military time that is, oh, 200 hours has to be done by this time, by this date, or we're out of here. There are small areas of overlap between military time and cinematic time because... It has to be done, I'm sorry, it has to be told in a certain amount of time as well. well. Film narrative tends to work through establishing deadlines. Uh-huh. That's one way in which you can derive momentum yes. to a plot, is you can go, hey, character A, you need to tell character B that character B has five minutes to do a thing. And okay, the viewer now knows that there's a sense of urgency. Okay, right, so deadline's quite important to drama, at least. And the military in this are just constantly establishing deadlines. And it does make the deadline principle of plot annoying, which I suppose makes our implied viewer go, oh, just leave these people alone and let Mm. procedures that take time happen, which I suppose is what anyone who is into scholarly research really wants to be the attitude of those in charge Mm. because some research projects take years. One of the things that seems to have distinguished Ted Chiang before he wrote this story is that he spent five years working as a linguist, according to Wikipedia. Must be fact-checked later on, I suppose, that one. I suppose it might be working as a linguist, or maybe he just attended a few linguistics courses at a local university. I also wrote down, while we're on nerd business, defamiliarisation cinematography, because there are so many shots where 
the camera was looking either straight up or straight down. And we'd call those extreme high angle shots, looking yeah. straight down, extreme low angle shots, looking straight up. But there, there are those shots where the resulting image is so unfamiliar that, mm-hmm. for me at least, it took a few seconds to go, what am I looking at? And yeah. therefore, where is the camera relative to what I'm looking at? I think that when they first arrive in the helicopter to the mm. site in Montana, and it's quite slowly circling around and it's realistic in the sense that it's sort of mirroring the actions of the helicopter but there's something slightly otherworldly about it and it's not just because of this sort of spaceship that's there Mm. don't even know what to call it because it's sort of pod like and it's a technology Mm. that's I mean, it's incredibly designed. It's so sleek. It's like a pebble, you know, so it's really weird to think of it as a technology that's much more advanced than anything that we've produced. But it is. That's there, but there's something sort of normal about it because it's just there. It's just sitting there. It's not moving. It's the movement of the camera that feels unnatural. And also something that's very real and of this earth, but unearthly, is the way the clouds kind of roll across the screen. There's something very eerie about that. who live in Cape Town, they call the clouds that sit on top of Table Mountain, mm. they call them the tablecloth because mm. they kind of drape over the edge before they evaporate as they lower down. There's so many photos from around the world of what uh-huh. happens when one weather system meets another yeah. is yeah. that you can get this wall of mist that abruptly mm. stops at one point and that kind of marches forward as the weather system comes in. I've been in parts of the world where the sea is really cold and land is quite hot mm. and the mists that you get in those kinds of situations are eerie. And I wouldn't be surprised if that mist was CGI'd in as well as yeah. the ship. Because the liquidness of our atmosphere seemed to be something that the heptapods found quite welcome. Because they do seem to live in a kind of nearly liquid It's almost liquid. Atmosphere. Yeah, it's, it's liquid-like. It's fluid. Yeah. There's flow. Mm. There's a kind of hefty weightlessness. It's quite paradoxical mm. in that there is gravity. She does fall when she's in that environment but her hair's flowing as if she's underwater and yet is mm. still hanging down. I think she can still breathe so it's part of that science fiction conceit of we're just going to have something be magically possible at this point so she's in this environment where supposedly mm. she can't breathe because they keep pumping that stuff out of the part of the ship mm. where the humans come in to communicate with them so she's in the part where she shouldn't be but she can breathe mm. nonetheless so maybe all that stuff of pumping it out of that area was pointless. Also on nerd business the slow dolly zooms when they'd made the jump the -hmm. the gravity jump from the Mm -hmm. was it called loader whatever that thing is (laughs) up into the ship that's the probe yeah when they (laughs) the reverse probe (laughs) the probe (laughs) they're getting probe mofos um So when they've made that jump onto what is now the inside of mm-hmm. the alien, so it's the wall of the alien ship, that kind of vertical corridor, we have two shots where it seems that the corridor is magically lengthening. Mm-hmm. But of course that's done through a dolly zoom mm-hmm. and it would be a dolly out zoom in. No, no a dolly in zoom out, is not it? It's it's a, I thought it was a do- dolly back and a zoom in. Well, it's, it's, cre- it's enhancing the impression of depth. And if you're, doing, if you're enhancing the impression of depth, that means that you're zooming out. So you'd have to dolly in and zoom out. It would be the opposite of the Jaws version. Because mm. the Jaws version... Oh, no, hang on. We'll, we we'll do another like recording of this. One. Yeah, in fact, it's, it's the same as all of them. It dolly in, zoom out. Yeah, it, it, cre- it start off zoomed in. Some of them do the opposite. Start off... Do, well, it, well, yeah. Well, I wrote down dolly back. Zoom in. And I wrote down. And you've written yeah. down well, the opposite. Well, I just I just wrote so down. So we're perceiving different things. Just wrote down dolly. Well, yeah. okay. Well, we'll, <laughs> we'll lay a one penny bet. That's on that just one. what I perceived, but then your eyes work better than mine, <laughs> so I'm, okay. I'm open right. to the improved role. We'll settle this without an international conflict later on. I thought when they were being taken out of the suits the first time, it was like a birthing. It was like Louise Banks being birthed in a way. Maybe that's a bit too obvious, but just the way they've been ripped out of the suits, the radiation suits, and breathing properly again, and things are starting to click into place for her. It's like a new way of life's opening out to her. But anyway, continue with your... My my new business. Okay, all right, so we ought to just mention that colour and contrast and lightness 
uh, aspects to the look of this film because there's no desaturating of colour. In fact, some of the colours seem to be quite sickly in their saturation. But there's lots of black and grey. There's even that one very late night conversation between Louise and Ian where it's barely possible mm-hmm. to see their faces. And they've got a quite a lit, sunsetty time sky behind them, but there's just not enough light. It's the kind of footage where if you saw that footage when you're doing rushes at the end of the day, someone in the room would go, OK, that's nowhere near properly lit. Just bin it and we'll do it again tomorrow. Yeah, but it's probably done in post, is it not? It's all very deliberately done, this stuff. And this relatively dark, relatively greyish look throughout the film is in really stark contrast to the illumination environment that they're in when they're talking with Abbott and Costello, because that bright, uh-huh. quite glowingly white yeah. screen that they use. And the daylight when it's the scenes with young Hannah yeah. as well. But I kept wondering, because they're in this military base, and it feels like it's night time all the time, and then there are times when they're going out to do another visit, and it's daylight. Yeah. But it feels so dark and oppressive in the military base buildings. Mm. But I kept wondering, do they not need to be able to see what they're doing? No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, maybe someone should have a talk. <laughs> well, that is part of the general nerd versus military yeah. uh, motif. Possibly, yeah. Like film. everything's sort of dark and closed in and, oh no, you can't share your toys with anybody. It's all ours. That mm-hmm. kind of stuff. Distrust of everything. It's, they can't even trust you to be able to see what you're doing. One more nerdy thing, I suppose, and it's music. But we probably need to give this guy a bit of attention. Film music is something I don't pay enough attention to. Mm. <laughs> that was me saying, no, you don't. <laughs> no, that was me saying, I also don't pay enough yeah. attention to film music. Which is shameful, because I studied music a bit when I was younger, and I should be more perceptible to this, but I've just been always drawn to the image. But yes, it's only really about two weeks since Johan Johansson, the composer for the film, died. He has scored quite a few prominent films that have come out in the past few years, as well as being somebody who's been working on concept albums and things quite a bit in the last number of years as well. I don't know that much about him. I don't know enough really about music and film in general. But yes, I think what's going on in this film does need attention. I wrote down that it's got, in a way, there's there's a kind of tradition that has grown in sci-fi of electronic music because it's weird, it's otherworldly. This has risen since at least the 1950s, possibly earlier than that, but definitely since the 1950s. So experiments with electronic music were happening and it was really only in terms of film it was the B movies and the avant-garde movies that were using electronic sounds, electronic music. From what I've been reading about him he has that very interesting mix of classical but that contemporary electronic music Mm -hmm. so you've got both of those things coming through in the film. So there's a kind of tradition with sci-fi scores And yet something feels brand new about this. Even though there's, as you were pointing out, there's excerpts in there from existing music. Yeah, relatively recent existing music, because this is Max Richter's... uh, What's it called? It's called On the Nature of Daylight, and it's from about 2003. But much more Mm -hmm. classically-oriented music. The piece of music which I think is the most conspicuous one of Johan Johansson's is... On the soundtrack listing, it's called Heptapod B. Mm -hmm. It's the one that's got that singer in it who's going... Yeah. It's characteristic of... I think really well done non diegetic sound where mm-hmm. it, the sound seems to kind of leak out of the mm-hmm. experience of being in the story space. So at some points the sound just seems to be the kind of groaning of machines, the kind of sense of overwhelmingness of being inside the ship. And but that piece which has that kind of really staccato, it's Morse codish mm-hmm. rhythm to it, iterating the sense of being faced with this language that you don't understand. Mm-hmm. The sense of the person who's trying to communicate with you doing so with determination and rhythm and order but one that you don't have any comprehension of. But it's an interesting way of using the voice as an instrument and the sounds that are being made are not words, they're not verbal communication, but the string of sounds that is being made can Mm. cause an emotive reaction in a similar way to a musical instrument playing those same notes. There's a a seminar that I do on the Masters that I teach on, which is one of my favourite seminars to do because this one is a seminar about sound. This question always comes up and it's, what is the minimum condition for something that counts as music? If you just get an instrument and just play a single note on that instrument, does it count as music? 
And I gather that, according to the strict definition of music, no, it doesn't. But nonetheless, we'll still categorise it under non-diegetic sound, and mostly by non-diegetic sound we mean music anyway. There was quite a few elements in Arrival where the sound we were getting was one sort of loud groaning noise, mm-hmm. and then with that tone would be held for about four or five seconds, and then we get another slightly different tone of loud groaning noise. There were ones that I felt sounded like pipes, mm. sustained really high-pitched pipes or strings and then maybe those sounds have been processed. That's mm. my guess from my very untrained ear. And so the convention of what counts as music seems to be not necessarily something that's being ingeniously torn to pieces in this film, but something which is just being brought to mind and slightly questioned. Yes, but like verbal language, it's disrupting what we think of as music. Yeah. Music is another language being well, disrupted in this film. Well, I meant to bring this up earlier, so you brought us back to it, which is mm-hmm. good. Hierarchy of language. When we were watching this previous year's Royal Institution Christmas lectures, they were about communication, and they devoted so much time... I can't even remember the, the name of the person who ran them. There was three of them. They were great. They devoted so much time to pointing out how many different species communicate... Mm-hmm. And how if you put all these things together, you have not just all of the forms of communication we use other than spoken mm-hmm. language. You have quite a lot of the aspects of spoken language as well. Mm-hmm. So spoken language, um, this is something I've had a little word with some linguistics colleagues about, specifically in reference to Arrive, mm-hmm. because they love to hear about a piece of fiction in which they're the heroes. They are heroes. Um, yeah. <laughs> they're proper yeah. heroes. Well, yeah. They love to hear that they're recognised as such in yeah. a piece of fiction. I said something like, does, you know how there's some chimpanzees who've learned very large numbers of mm-hmm. symbols and they can use them to communicate quite fast using these little touchpads or these pointing boards. Have they learned grammatical language? And I'm often told by linguistics colleagues, well, that's a tautology because language is by definition grammatical. That's what we mean by language. Mm-hmm. If it's not grammatical, it's simply communication. Mm-hmm. So that's not to say that communication is some way impoverished because as we learned in the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures, mm-hmm. Layer upon layer upon layer of communication has characterised our evolutionary forebears for hundreds of millions of years Mm. before the very, very recent development of sound-based grammatical language. Mm. And so that started off with smell, where one tiny organism would emit some particles and those would be sensed by another tiny organism. Yes, it's the same, this is my territory, or I'm on heat, let's have a go at this, shall we? Or whatever. So we still have elements of smell communication is part of mm-hmm. how we operate, which go all the way back to protozoa mm-hmm. interacting. What else? There was gesture. Mm-hmm. So they look at the forms of gesture which are adopted by the other great apes, including some what seemed to be grammatical use of signing amongst mm-hmm. chimpanzees. If that's the case, if it does actually have a grammar, if the words have to go into a specific order, then that's a grammatical language in non-humans, which is very cool. Okay, what else was there? There was tone in the voice of deer. Mm. When deer are calling to each other, the tone seems to have something to do with status. Oh, and of course there was touch as well. There seems to be a pervasive way in which touch is used to communicate. Do you remember they showed that way that chimpanzees communicate not just through gesture but also through specific sorts of touching Mm. and that lots Mm. of touching of hands seems to be used to organise. Yeah, they say sorry Um, or thanks. Got all these forms of communication which are based on senses other than hearing and communication which uses hearing but which is not grammatical language as well and our grammatical language comes really late to this party and our writing as a transcribing of our grammatical language is an even later Mm -hmm. addition to it and so we would have good reason to think well any species would of course only write having first established earlier languages languages, but of course that's only the case in the environment which is earth with a liquid atmosphere, sound might be an awful way of communicating. Well, that's the thing, because the sound sort of mutes the way it does, say, if you're in a swimming pool when Louise goes to see Costello, is, or is it Abbott? Have, it's about. have we just been a heptopodist? Does she say, think... where's Costello? I can't remember. That's terrible. Okay. I can't. It's my memory that's terrible. Yeah. They all look the same. <laughs> <laughs> she, can, she can tell... She knows Which that, one it no, is, they yeah. do. They do look different, and I saw that in the credits they were motion capture, so people 
outside them. Her voice and her ability to hear is sort of muted. It's kind of like she's in a swimming pool. But you see, that's the thing because, isn't it, we know more about space than we know about our own oceans. Creatures like whales and dolphins have sonic communication. I did get a sense, though, of an attempt to evoke whale song. Why did I get that? Was it a piece of the non-diegetic music? Mm, might have been. Or was it just that I was reminded of Star Trek IV, the, <laughs> the, the voyage home? The whale. Star Trek III, the voyage home? The whale. It's four with the whale. It's the only one I know. <laughs> So I remember it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had written down sensory experiences, so things like texture, atmosphere, the heft and awkwardness of the precautionary radiation suits, the sense of gravity and how that changes when they're in the ship. So things like that, texture, touch how sound carries in the atmosphere, all those sorts of things. And you start to think about, well, how do I show? And they're behind a screen and you're behind a screen for them. Mm -hmm. So it's about showing rather than hearing and saying. The film does a damn good job of going, this is the experience that these people are having. So things like extreme close-ups when people are in the hazmat suits floaty moving camera yeah moving camera where it's like it's a camera that's trying to stay still but just can't quite do it mm-hmm. so it's ever so slowly reframing all the time and the sound the picture being quite dense in that mm-hmm. includes lots of people breathing and lots of incidental noise so it feels slightly claustrophobic and that's giving us a range of things to empathise with so that we also will feel just a little bit... You can feel the way... You know, when when Louise first puts on that big radiation suit, you can see how heavy it is on her body and she's not used Mm. to anything like that. This is somebody who works in an office and is, you know, an academic and so it's more likely than not to be socially awkward and you get a glimpse of that when she's with her students early on. Well, she comes across as pretty paved that everybody's Mm. buggered off. It's what's not said, which is really interesting in those her interactions with other humans. It's what's mm. not said that communicates so much. And that's actually something we all need to think about more because it's often those gaps in our language where we cannot say what it is when we cannot say what we're feeling when we cannot articulate. That can often say much more. We get to the end of the film and we, well, actually it's a good maybe three quarters of the way through roughly. She says, I know why my husband left me, but she does you know, this is in the future where Ian ends up leaving her because she tells him what's going to happen and you have to imagine that he can't deal with it and that they shouldn't have gone through with this knowing that Hannah's going to die quite horribly and it's the saying that causes the difficulty it's the communication actually that's the problem but sometimes the gaps in our communication say so much which is something we don't think about often enough Well, one thing that came to mind was the moral misdeed of passengers. We talked about this a bit, where what effectively happens in passengers is that one character effectively murders another one Uh by waking them up early from hypersleep so that they will die of old age before they get Uh to their destination. They won't be lonely. That's a whole other discussion then about Louise, is why does she go through with it, knowing that this child who's so precious to her is going to die, but it's the fulfilment that both of them have. Well, see, it wasn't that I was talking about. It wasn't like Hannah's life Uh or the suffering that Louise is going to go through. She seems to know that that's going to happen and decide to to do it anyway. That it needs to happen because it's already happened. This is where you have to start to consider space time. It's different from fate and yes we can change our destinies but she's already aware that all of this has happened but it just hasn't happened yet because she's seen it already yeah, so well, it has to happen I was also reminded by this is just going to be a kind of web of intertextuality today I was reminded of the Back to the Future the first one the principle in that where it simultaneously has the past as something that you can change and the idea that you've always been going around and around in time mm-hmm. and the fact that you've already gone back in time is why aspects of your life are the way that they are so it does two of these things at the same time it has yeah. simultaneously has this determinist strand and it has this you can change your future strand make a different decision if you don't have the race 
Yeah, so... Um, it's been erased, the future's been erased because you haven't written it yet. Well, that's the thing, is that when you get to the third film, mm -hmm. that's the kind of concluding message. Yeah. It's the future's not determined. Mm -hmm. But there's aspects of the first film which Where says determined. the future's determined. And the it's second, well, the, the end of the first and then going into the second one. Your kids, Marty, <laughs> something's got to be done about your kids. Well, I could just make a change now rather than having to go into the future. Let's yeah. just not have kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think what's going on in Arrival is if she knows... Mm -hmm that the future is going to be set, why does she do anything at all to try to get hold of General Shang? Because she has to. So there's a sense that things could go wrong. Things could happen a different way. There could be this global war. It feels like there's no time to think about it because she's having those flash forwards, but it's as if her future is in conversation with her present and her oh. past all at the same time. I feel like I should brush up on the Deleuze, but who can be bothered with that? <laughs> um, the slices of time that are yeah. sliding over one another. It's kind of like you take a chunk out of a film and you can put it somewhere else and change the meaning. It's space time. It's I keep thinking back of Professor Brian in Wonders of the Universe, I think it was, the episode where he talks about space time and he uses the photograph as the example of how to imagine slices of time, slices of space time where this is a thing that exists it still exists, it's a moment that for us to our understanding is, has passed and it's long dead, it's long gone but it exists in space time so these moments that Louise experiences exist in space time and they're speaking to her in a different part of space time, that's so how I understand it, she's actually put in dialogue with herself through a memory process but it's a memory process that's going forward and backward at the same time. It's like the palindrome. So I wonder then, is that actually incompatible with a film going peril, 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 peril? The peril's getting greater, the peril's getting greater. There's pressure on our main characters to fix this disequilibrium and get rid of the peril. So there has to be a conflict with struggling of wills. Yeah, but the peril's actually, coming from the other it, humans. Well, yeah. And so if everything's fine in the future because she will sort this problem out, mm. she will learn heptapod, she will have Hannah. But if that's all going to happen... bigger thing, yeah. yeah. Why does the film dramatise any sort of rising tension and conflict? Because it's a film. Um, it's and, <laughs> yeah. So what it has to do is it, the it's a film thing. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a film that challenges many of the conventions around mm -hmm. filmmaking, but one that it keeps in place is one which is based upon the idea that we do have free uh, will. Has to unbutton. And that we can ch choose yeah. different paths in our future, even though what it's simultaneously at the same time doing is mm -hmm. saying our future is entirely deterministic and could if we had a reason, a, a much better computing power than we currently have, we could completely predict what's going to happen in the future. So we have two different texts mm. within this. Sometimes one takes over from the other. And I did say earlier that, that it was the film's second principal message was the don't assume that people communicate spoken language before they communicate written language. I think the film's actual principal conceit is that it's possible to live with determinism. Mm. It's possible to live even if one was able to actually make an accurate prediction about what's mm. going to happen for the rest of your life. That life would still be worth living because life in general tends I mean, to be worth living. And while we're on that kind of area, it also reinforces heteronormativity and the family unit, the male and female cisgendered people getting together to create a child. There was one tiny glimmer of the film not quite doing that. I'll put this in perspective. Yeah, the film did seem to go, oh, do you think Louise and Ian might get together? They might get together. They're both nerds. They're going to get together. <laughs> and of course they'll have a child. In spite of the fact that this film did have a woman as its main protagonist and had him as a bit of a sidekick and her mm -hmm. making the biggest difference, a nonetheless heteronormative arc. But I did notice that there's that moment when Ian says, you should know that I was actually more surprised by you than I was by the heptopod. And they turn and they face each other and they have that they're going to kiss moment. But it's a hug. But it's a face grab, and mm -hmm. then it's a hug. Mm -hmm. So it's a, oh, you think it's these characters are going to kiss? But yeah. actually it's going to be an expression of companionship first, mm -hmm. and you're going to have to wait. The getting together of these characters is going to happen in implied time, months exactly. down the line, at yeah. least. So it, I did resist it to a small extent. No, I did, yeah, no. I, of course they get divorced. Well, the, the passengers thing that I was mentioning, a decision made to do something that, from one perspective, is a really immoral thing to do for another mm. person is that she seems to decide to have Hannah, even knowing what will happen to Hannah, mm. without telling him. She seems to tell him he, after she, she's, already she's a been child. born. Yeah, she seems to be a few years old. Yeah, so what she could do is just 
But what, what if she couldn't bear it anymore? What if she yeah. tried to sort of opted to never tell him and then couldn't bear it anymore? Or but also she gets to a point where she realizes this is the time. It feels intuitive, it feels compulsive, it doesn't feel premeditated. It's like when we're on earlier when she makes a phone call to General Chang. It's all happening in the moment. She doesn't have time to think about it. It's I'm getting this flash now of what's happening in the future in 18 months time i will be dressed up i will be at this fancy do this man is going to approach me and say these things to me i need to act on this this minute this is happening right now there's no control these moments that are 18 months apart are suddenly one and the same they're combined they're happening together it's like the massive diagram of the heteropod language that massive thing that's thrown at them yeah. and Ian identifies all the points where it's his time and there's no lines there's nothing obviously connecting him it's the gaps in between mm. speak to each other that's how they communicate they're brought together through the gaps so their symbols counteract linearity because they don't seem to have any beginning or end because they're circles uh-huh. but the fact that they're then given to them in that sea of circles yeah. as well there's no linearity to that either exactly it's and it's, it makes a shape moments. you see the 3d impression of it and he can rotate it and move it around and show the spaces between these things because mm. they've been projected onto that screen in a kind of 3d in yeah. a way as well because they're going backwards there's one that are out of focus and they're going mm. backwards it's a massive blob of them we're talking about this sort of liquid space it's a liquid language it's a liquid mm. visualisation of a language that, that has flow that flows out of them it's fluid and it gathers with fluidity when Louise reaches her hands out and she can actually write in it she can write in it with her hands that was a bit etch-a-sketch <laughs> No, because that's rigid lines. This is it was, round yeah. and flowing. It's goopy, goopy, goopy version of actually yeah. One thing though, this is a, a language which you seem to need to have eyes to see. Exactly, yes, to, it's to, a visual yeah, language. You need, eyes to, you need so, eyes to communicate in it. The haptopods don't seem to have eyes. <laughs> yes, but that again, we have to rethink senses in general because yeah. they also don't, don't seem to have ears, but they don't have what we think of as eyes. What do we see in different ways? There's different ways of perceiving something. I have my eyes shut right now, but I can feel the sofa underneath me. I can feel the air. I'm Mm -hmm. aware of certain things. There's different ways of seeing if you have no literal sight. They might have some sort of equivalent of the way that bats yeah there's a few little sonic things because maybe Mm. that's what sounds do as well because they um, Mm. emit sounds but they don't use them to communicate but maybe they do in a way because they can perceive distance and proximity and things like that this film has totally science fictioned us up hasn't it (laughs) we're speculating about the logistics of what happens in the story space when there may actually be huge gaps in the the knowledge there because the film may just go I'm not telling but that's what we do as academics and theorists we overthink everything. Yeah. Well, we, we're also willing to entertain the possibility that there might be inconsistencies in this but film. There's, and there call might be inconsistencies, there. but also, isn't it more fun to think through these problems? Yeah. But they've thought of a lot, and I think, isn't there in the extras, there's the designs for the aliens mm-hmm. and things, and it's really fascinating what they ended up coming up with. When we're on the bit with Louise simultaneously thinking about what to do now that the base is being evacuated Mm. and there seems to be a big crisis going on, and she's having the premonitions of, or the memories, of meeting General Shang, Mm. the graphic contrast there is quite extreme Mm. because the base, that whole environment is very blue and quite dark, and her at that ball, Mm. that that party, whatever the event is, it's very orangey-yellow. There's a warmth. And Mm. also, the way that she's shot, she seems to be shot so that she's wearing one of those kind of shoulderless dresses. Mm. She seems to be shot so that the bottom of the frame is just above the top of the dress, Mm. making her seem completely vulnerable because she's essentially just naked except for a bit of jewellery. And there is a lot of this film with Amy Adams looking worried, as if it has some sort of very deeply buried textuality about why it is that either women are more liable to experience anxiety Mm. in any situation where they're they're put under what demands are made of them, or the anxieties that women are caused to suffer are something which we should more generally (laughs) realise. Should we just more generally realise that women constantly suffer anxiety? Well, they're usually caused by men, as are wars. (laughs) 
Hey, and is the film doing this? Is the film going, look at all these anxieties that people have caused this character? Yeah. Or are they going, this is just a really anxious character? She's anxious, but she's got reason to be. But also, she's got all these men surrounding her. If you think about Louise's encounter early on with... Colonel Weber when he turns up at her office. The interesting thing is the double standards coming from him. She's watching the news broadcast and he says, oh, they expect us to know everything in two minutes. And then proceeds to play her a tiny audio excerpt and expects her to be able to translate the language. And, you know, she's having to explain, I need to be with them. It's not just about emitting and receiving sound. Language is about if you're communicating and there's no common ground, you need to be able to see each other and sense each other and all those sorts of things and he's quite aggressive and militaristic of course about saying look these are the terms you're either working with us or I'm out of here she's like there's nothing I can do and when they pick her up it's shades of extraordinary rendition as well there's just suddenly a helicopter outside of her her house at night like an alien abduction scene and she's given 10 minutes to pack a bag. Yeah. It's always, I need, can I have 15 minutes? You've got 10. Yeah. I need 20 minutes to sort myself because I'm in my pyjamas right now. No, 10. That's that man's world now, bitch. The aggressiveness, the abruptness. And she's like, look, because it sounds very fruity and liberal, but it's not really. If more men or male or masculine cultures, aspects of culture or society or politics, whatever, if they just sat down and listened to a woman who knows what she's talking about, which is quite a lot of us, it would just make everything so much easier because him always saying, if you do that, it's going to be slower. No, 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 it'll actually be faster because it'll make more sense if we take the baby steps and do <clears throat> all of these things. And of course, she's right. And she's an expert in her field and nobody likes <clears throat> listening to those. She's the woman who wants to sit and listen and experience and think about things and work it out. Whereas all the beds are like, blow that shit! <laughs> We might want to start another category, which is the blackboard stroke whiteboard moment. <laughs> because we're all very familiar with the blackboard moment. Yes, moment. where there's the explanatory thing on the board. So this is the whiteboard version of what <laughs> Doc Brown does in back, the second like Back to the Future equations. film. Yeah. <laughs> so she gets the whiteboard, she writes out a sentence, yeah. and she starts to deconstruct it into its component parts. Yeah. But then also goes, we don't even know whether these beings have a concept of a question what a question is. or a concept of intent yeah. and so we have to build our understanding of their language uh-huh. so that we know whether this question will even make sense to them yeah. and then we can start generating the vocabulary and then we can work out the necessary uh-huh. grammar and then we can ask them so the question whereas he's just going learn words and yeah, that's going to get them nowhere so how yeah. explaining the, the complexity of the system using the whiteboard mm-hmm. which we need more of yeah. in science fiction <laughs> definitely we're going to pause and have a little lecture now and it will have narrative purpose. Uh-huh. And it's so fascinating how such a massive amount of information is conveyed in just a few words that make up that question. What yeah. is your purpose here? And everything she has to get through to get to that point. Even if you're just learning another verbal language having to go through those steps of being able to construct a question like that. All the things you need to learn and to have in place to get something that in your own language you don't even have to think about. I don't experience of learning other languages mm-hmm. our experience of learning languages which are relatively close cousins to English as well uh-huh. and so we're learning different grammars but like grammar can differ much more significantly Absolutely. than what we've, we've learned and then you've got what about languages that use different symbols so we're already dealing with that in our own world it's a fascinating question to ask of a film like this what if we do because it's probably going to happen at some point not likely in our lifetime but some point somewhere in the future there could be contact with mm-hmm. other intelligent life forms and they need to be able to find something to communicate with so if we can't even understand each other yet which is mm. sort of one of the messages of the film we have to figure out how to work together before we can deal with what's going on outside of our own world because we are so tiny there's every possibility that we are not unique at least not in this time and place because again mm. if you think about space time there could be other worlds worlds out there that have already been and gone that we'll never know about we haven't seen their light yet and Mm. may never do because it could be gone by the time we go Uh, or very far in the future of this universe there will be more so there's every possibility of those things happening and if the beings on one world can't communicate how are they going to do intercommunication
location elsewhere. It's one of these internationalist films, not just in the sense of having a narrative which requires characters to overcome the immaturity that is nationalism. Mm. It's also internationalist in the sense that there's no sense of tribalism amongst the aliens. The aliens yeah. are united by being part of a common species. Mm-hmm. That's and, it. But maybe they've had a journey to get there. You know, there's all mm. these different ways of going with this beyond the film. There was a bit that I really didn't notice in cinemas, or at least I can't remember noticing in cinemas, which is the possible setup for a sequel because the amptipods say in yeah. 3,000 years we'll need your help. It's like you need to start knowing our language now because mm. we're really going to need you. But the thing is, maybe she should have found out why... Because <laughs> what if they're the bad guys <laughs> and they've just weaponized yeah. the human race? But I'm paranoid, mm. so that's where I'm going to go with that. <laughs> but they give the gift of unlocking this language that unlocks time itself. Mm. And I don't know if that's a good thing because mm. humans can't even cope with how we experience time as it is. How would the human brain? Because we're mm. developed, but we're underdeveloped. Most of what our brain is potentially capable of, we have not accessed yet. Maybe in 3,000 years, but that doesn't seem like very long mm. for the brain to evolve that much. I was explaining to one of my offspring the other day about why it is that our brains are our specialism. The survival mechanism, which is equivalent to wings on birds Mm -hmm. and the claws on lions. And that we pay a hefty price for that in quite high infant mortality. Mm -hmm. Because getting heads out of people is harmful. That's the direction in which we've niched as a species. But it's banging up against logistical limits. Like... um, how big a baby's head can be and still be gestated inside yeah. another person yeah. has logistical limits. There's that. And then there's the fact that they're so underdeveloped when they do come out because mm. so many other species and our, many of our fellow mammals come out and they're instantly able to walk. I once pulled a cow out of another cow. It was quite a tricky business because it was a breech birth. And that calf was able to walk within about 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. Whereas we're just hopeless. As far as, <laughs> <laughs> as, far as that goes. We're just yeah. poop machines yeah. <laughs> for <laughs> quite a while mm-hmm. for 18 years <laughs> we just found him poop uh, right um, uh, well I suppose on this the film does bring in these non-terrestrial mm-hmm. intelligent beings which are clearly quite physically superior to the humans as well mm-hmm. they're not just technologically more advanced they're much bigger you tower over the humans yeah but if they're they could... going to need the humans help in 3,000 years they can't be all that if they need idiots they got to help them <laughs> 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 Maybe they just needed some comedy. Well, I suppose one, one of the, one of the um, bits that I liked in this was that there's a promised future of high-speed technological advancement and international cooperation yeah. in this story space because yeah. the humans have got a lot of information dumped on their lap and yeah. they're now going to have a revolutionised view of the universe. However, it's not going to happen fast enough for a cure for this mm. very rare disease exactly. to be discovered in yeah. time to save There's Hannah. A really good thing. So there is a sense that stuff takes time, that there is inertia to the development of knowledge. Just on this idea of them being given gifts, it's this gift of the technology. Mm-hmm. I'm just thinking, because we very often talk about religion because we're not fans of it particularly, there's an interesting thing going on here about gifts descending from above but yeah. these are ones that you can see they have evidence they have application in the real world within the world of the film is there some sort of tension then with religious belief of a deity you know an unseen deity that hands out gifts to chosen few believers whereas this is like well you can't deny it because it's happened well I was watching a documentary earlier about it was a 1977 documentary presumably made for TV about Star Wars there was a little extract in it where George Lucas was explaining that what he did with the force was he just took all the religions he knew of and just boiled them down to what might link them all and he seemed to be making this quite common claim that all religions are basically just half glimpses of a larger truth the documentary shows the bit from Star Wars where one of the military commanders on the Death Star says don't try to frighten us with your sorcerer's ways Lord Vader your sad devotion to that ancient religion hasn't helped you conjure up the stolen data tapes or given you clairvoyance enough mm-hmm. to show us the location of the rebels for this is one of those instances where it's clearly a religion and then there's a moment where the practitioner of the religion goes oh you don't believe in this I'll just do some magic and I'll show you that this is a thing and that you should believe in it now in Arrival it seems 
Oops. To be in favour of a limited disclosure model about what these aliens do. These 12 alien ships, they are trying to approach different peoples from around the world, but only a very small select number of people get to go and interact with the aliens. Is that perhaps a metaphor for a kind of God's chosen people? Mm. Or maybe not the elect, but maybe just religious leaders, maybe clergy people. But it's and the experts, it's well, linguists, the thing. it's <laughs> physicists, it's mathematicians. If it's alluding to anything about religion, what it's doing is it's going, if there's something observable about this the people to go and study it are the ones who've been spending their entire lives studying mm. natural phenomena and they can go and derive an understanding of it rather than a mystification of mm. it and they can demonstrate the truth of what they've observed mm. to other people rather than just insisting that other people have faith in it there was that one specific reference to religion cult. in it which yeah. was that a cult had decided that this was the day of judgment and they'd mm. all killed themselves the film I think shares our view about what institutionalised religions mm. at least tend to do and that they insist on believing on yeah. in things on bad evidence. And if they're removing themselves from this life <laughs> well that's what the narrating principle of the film yeah. seems to think so yeah this film was very pro-nerd and it did this thing which comes up a lot in discussions about religion which is that when it's someone who is a believer up against somebody who's not the believer will often go well as far as you're concerned your view of the universe is totally deterministic mm. therefore there's no point in us even having this conversation because your beliefs are just determined by the way you fizz and my beliefs are determined the way I fizz so we might as well just not have this it's a kind of mutually disarming move mm. And, of course, what this film says is being faced with a deterministic universe is not necessarily a daunting thing. We may find it daunting because we're used to thinking of ourselves as magic, as having souls and therefore there's a ghost in the machine who's undetermined. Mm. But if we shed that thinking, an understanding of what the universe is actually like, an understanding of what matter and energy actually do, even if they're completely deterministic, is in itself rewarding enough to make it worth living a totally deterministic life. Mm. And also, those deterministic lives are tremendously complex complicated as well and so their predictability to anybody who doesn't have this particular mm. seemingly psychic ability that Louise Banks has is indistinguishable from non-predictability. Yes we'll actually think through what determinism implies and what might be the worst instance of it well it might be you could predict in advance that you were going to have a child who's going to die what would you do in that situation and I think Banks towards the end she even specifically asks it she asks mm. it of Donnelly she says if you could see your whole life from start to finish would you change things and he doesn't answer well he uh, says I'd probably speak my feelings more oh yeah so he says yes he would but he says something quite personal yeah and I think that's not exactly what she meant is it that was something I was going to raise as well is that conflation of the personal with the mass of the micro and the macro are one and the same. You know, if you ask this character, Louise Banks, what's the biggest thing that's ever happened in her life? What's the most significant event of her life? Would it be the very existence of her daughter having lived at all? Or would it be that she met these aliens and cracked their language? To her, mm. what if those are one and the same? Because they are intertwined, they're related to each other. Well, the film has her realise both of these things about her future at almost uh -huh. exactly the same time. Exactly. And it, I think it is one of those deus ex machina moments uh -huh. where we need this character to suddenly be able to speak this alien language yeah. so let's just have her have this ability just clicks into place. to just imagine that moment in the future when she will have written her book about the alien language yeah. and, and she learns his... from her own book <laughs> she's reading yeah. her own book to continue this web of intertextuality mm. that's the bit in Spaceballs mm -hmm. where General they was watch it, the film is yeah. it General Sanders? Colonel Sanders Can, Colonel, sorry, yeah, KFC, KFC Colonel thing, yeah. Sanders when Sanders says Bring me the videotape of Spaceballs. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> so they can see what's happening simultaneously and in a different scene. Should we pause and have a slightly metaphorical discussion? Inspired by this film. What do you mean? Well, okay, let's take that question that Banks asked. Mm. She says, if you could see your whole life from start to finish, uh -huh. would you change things? Uh, well, I was thinking about this actually because it's one of those things. You know, that we we would often say, "Oh, if somebody had have told me that three years time this would be your life, would you have believed it?" So it's similar to that. Somebody like me, who's had probably a very difficult life for the first twenty, thirty years, it's been a real struggle many times. As somebody who's had a lot of deaths of people close to them at young ages, and then whose twenties were just a blur of abusive relationships relationships not necessarily only romantic ones but also with institutions and mm. other kinds of individuals in your life as well that kind of thing and doing a PhD far too young and the pressures of that and being a working class person doing a PhD 
and if anybody had have told me like this is what you're gonna have to go through in academia before you realize that's not what you should be doing and not because you're not smart enough but because it's not working you're too principled you don't fit because it doesn't fit it's the problem not you the system is broken so all the things you have to go through to get to a point of being in limbo but it being in a much happier place would you do it that's the point where i'm at at the moment in my fairly early 30s and clinging on to early 30s at the moment you're just clinging on to 30s (laughs) for the coming days and uh, (laughs) for me that's where i'm at because i don't know the future and i don't know what the answer could be so in 40 years time if i'm still kicking around and somebody asks me this again the answer could be entirely different but if i was asked if you knew when you were little what you're gonna have to go through to get to this point when you're 33 and things are actually relatively calm and happy and it's not perfect but it's the happiest you'll have probably been your whole life would you do it and you'd have to think well okay maybe a lot of those other things were worth it and what if your experiences end up helping other people what if you have to go through the trials because you're going to end up having the experience to help somebody else and get them through something quicker or give them the support they need later Mm. on it's not just about you so with Louise it's not just about her and it's not just about her having a baby because she selfishly wants to bring a child and have a mini her in the world this child needs to be in the world because that child is part of the connection that gives the answer to peace and development and advancement to the human race well, and may help this other race long in the future long after they're all gone it did just strike me that there might be a an abortion narrative in there in that the film might be saying if you could, one of the things that happens with at the 12 week scan is early noticing of signs of Down syndrome and that's the scan which is the main source of information about actually quite a large variety of possible re- motives to have an abortion now is the film going hey look this really brave woman she knew before the fetus was even conceived that the person into which that fetus would grow would die of a terminal illness mm. and she decided to keep that fetus hey isn't she brave maybe that's what's going on under the surface I think it's a good point as well it's like would you get pregnant in the first place if you knew it was going to happen but there's a bigger issue going on because she knows that it's related to this other massive thing that she needs Mm -hmm. to and it's already happened it's already in the works again it's her experience of time has transformed because she can only do what she does in the past by knowing what she's done in the future maybe it's just the fact of her usefulness to the narrative has to go via her uterus that's slightly troubling me yeah no it is troubling and again it's sort of frustrating like why couldn't she have been a lesbian why couldn't she have been a disabled person why couldn't she have been a woman who can't conceive why couldn't she have been a trans person who has other things going on it's any number of things like it's sort of still a kind of white heteronormative and let's face it they're very middle class as well I mean what mm. academic can afford the sort of house that she lives in there's a whole book to be written on the representation of academics in fiction even if the house was inherited or something it's not going to be that clean let's face it she lives on her own she and um, Ian both mention being single and it seems like it's a long term thing with both of them she lives in a remote place there should be books everywhere I remember reading I think it was only a, something on cracked.com a few years back and it was about how if you just take a sample of five randomly selected American films which contain characters who don't drive every single one of those films will associate the fact that the character doesn't drive with some sort of character deficiency and the archetype for this is the 50 year old virgin mm. he doesn't drive he just has a bike and the film associates it's him being a virgin this with is being a problem. In the US, though. The, yeah, just in the US. Because there's such so, a driving culture there. Yeah. So the principle is, in US cinema, if you don't drive, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's something quite similar goes for vegetarianism in US films as well. <laughs> anyway, so we could do something very similar with academics yeah. in US films. <laughs> They'll be single, only able to communicate with other academics, incapable of realising that their students are humans. <laughs> There's um, got to be more. They always have really tidy offices and homes and really big, spacious homes and drink out of proper wine glasses. <laughs> that is not <laughs> yeah. what we do. So, yeah. <laughs> we just drink wine straight out of the bottle. I mean, and especially in the United States, <laughs> academics are paying off their debts 
for a bl- you yeah. till oblivion. I mean, independently wealthy wine connoisseurs, incapable of forming relationships uh-huh. with other humans except for academics. No regional accents, mostly yeah. white. White from the east coast. There's a book. Go. <laughs> <laughs> write, write that book. I've come to the end of my notes. Oh, really? I had written notes about how we deceive each other with language. So there's the crisis talk in the news broadcasts, but also the kangaroo story, which is really nicely done. Telling kangaroo, and Louise tells Forrest Whitaker's character this story about people arriving in it was what Captain would Cook's Captain life. Cook yeah. you arriving in what would become Australia and what's that kangaroo and the mm-hmm. sort of breakdown of language that actually it meant I, I, I don't, don't know, know what, what you're you mean. saying yeah. yeah I don't know what you're saying and then that's maybe an example of how academics think but I don't know if a lot of us are that sleek or quick thinking <laughs> but maybe that was an example she uses with students this is how you can tell a story and just it automatically be believed because it it's perceivable that that could be true. I think the structure in that which implies that it's genuine is that it describes a misunderstanding and so it permits the hearer to go, oh, I didn't make that misunderstanding. I understood the two positions uh-huh. here. I have not been deceived. And to get someone to go, I have not been deceived was a perfect way of getting mm-hmm. them to accept the deception. <laughs> For the benefit mm-hmm. of anyone who ever listens to this, I think you might need to define sleek it. Oh, right. Well, it means quite sly or sneaky. It's an Ulster Scots word. If somebody's being sleek at, they're being quite crafty, clever, maybe a bit underhand. You know, it's interested in bringing up dialect and words from a dialect when we're talking about language. There's this thing which we tend to let it go completely under the radar when we're talking about science fiction. You know, uh, another bit of intertextuality. There's a bit in Star Trek V, The Undiscovered Country, where they're meeting with the Klingons and there's somebody quotes from a bit of Shakespeare and one of the Klingons says, you haven't really appreciated it until you've heard it in the original Klingon. Why is their language named after their species? Yeah. Because our language we is not named... We don't speak Cuban. Yeah, we yeah. <laughs> and so here we are in, in Arrival. The language, they just call it heptapod. In fact, that piece of music, that really quite characteristic one, it's called heptapod B. They refer to it as logograms. Oh, that's the, the type the, of... Yeah, the type of... Su- symbol. Symbols that they make. But she opens the book up yeah. and it, it's got two components and the second uh-huh. one is a, a heptapod manual. But that's a Again, our way of understanding the other. We'll often do this when we don't know what language a nationality speaks. Uh-huh. We'll say something like, if I said I'm going to Nigeria, if I didn't know about the, the four langu- main languages mm-hmm. that are spoken in Nigeria and that none of them are called Nigerian, I might say something like, I don't know how to speak Nigerian. Because I just assume that because in general, languages correspond to the designations we uh-huh. give to people groups. Hopefully in that instance, the language spoken in yeah. that area by that group of people is the same name as the area yeah. but it's just no way near that simple what were we watching and it was a comedy and the person said oh that's a relief I don't know how to speak American <laughs> and it was an English person was that in the Windsor it might have been in the Windsor gone, it might have been Harry gone so into text. it might have been Harry because it's the second <laughs> season with Meghan Markle yes, but... <laughs> Another thing I just wrote down there now, uh, when we were talking about that discussion about if you knew that your child would die, I was thinking about Abbott or Costello, because we can't remember which one dies, and the other one says, thing is death process. And that's such a moving thing. It's so clinical when it comes on screen in the subtitle, but what a moving way of saying that somebody's dying, saying is death process. So we don't know what stage of death that this being is that mm. you know you don't know what their death is and what death means to them is it the extinction of life what yeah. does it mean to be dead in that species yeah. I suppose they're trying to give a sense of these translations are always imperfect because uh-huh. no translation is perfect but I suppose the idea they're trying to get there is that dying isn't something that you do it's a process it's something that happens to you it's a process that your body becomes it's always happening mm. from the moment we're born we begin to die everything that's alive is in death process there's just something about that that phrase that it's beautifully put it's a beautiful use of the English language that isn't quite English as I remember it from when we saw it in cinemas it was um, quite memorable what I remembered was is in death process whereas this is more visceral it's yeah. not that he's in this process he is he death is, process he is the process so um, you filled mm. in a gap 
there in the language because that's how we would say it but it's not even how another person learning English might say it they might say mm. something similar to this I think we've probably maxed out on our everything's connected thing because this is coming to your current experience with having to teach English yeah I was just thinking that but also as somebody who's been glacially slowly learning Spanish you've been doing it with the well, determination of a glacier as well you're unstoppable I think part of the issue of why it's so slow is that I am doing it alone with podcasts and using um, an app many are available which means I can read it and it's got these technologized voices saying generic Latin American Spanish at me so I'm not getting Spanish Spanish and using podcasts the ideal thing for learning any other language is to be able to see yeah. for a person because yeah. actually we were talking about this today so I've recently started to volunteer with Action Language they're a charity based in Newcastle upon Tyne and they do free English language classes for mostly refugees and asylum seekers and also there are people there whose spouses have got work in the UK and they're learning the language from scratch there's a multitude of reasons but it's aimed at refugees and asylum seekers because not only can you not if you haven't got access to the language you also if you're in that position you need to be able to tell your story you need to be able to tell it well so it's about giving people the tools to communicate for themselves empower them and be able to tell their own story in their own words as far as they can get the words but we were talking about this uh, issue just today is that how to actually show someone how to make sounds because there are sounds in all of our languages that many of us can't make and the instructor at the training session for us as the teaching assistants was using Spanish as an example the first example she gave was something I am really struggling with and it's the double R sound I cannot do it I can hear descriptions of what it's like in the podcasts I listen to and I'm hearing it <coughs> all the time yeah. when I'm doing these things but I cannot make that sound. When anyone's trying to articulate to a child how to make a sound they'll go up <laughs> close to them they'll open their mouth mm -hmm. and they'll do a big pantomimic exactly. version of this is me making the sound. So you need to start so, doing things like that. Lots of it's not I'm thirsty it's I'm thirsty yeah. you know we'll do like big yeah. exaggerated versions of You'll it them with your mouth so we were talking through quite a lot of that today and actually gave me a sheet that has diagrams of a lot of these things like what your tongue's supposed to be doing and you've just got very excited about the diagrams these date back well over a century and a half uh -huh. these the systems of notation based on what yeah. each of the parts of your speech system doing at any one time so tell us about the double r it's interesting and a bit frustrating because the podcasts i listen to are done by scottish people so of course they can do it perfectly <laughs> <laughs> Whereas the rest that's, of us in the UK the third. struggle with it. The third. How do you do that? I cannot make that noise. No matter how much I try, I can't mm -hmm. make the noise. It's quite yeah, it's tricky. Yeah. The example is is a perfect one because there's a word pero, which means butt, and there's a perro, which is dog. <laughs> and I cannot do the the roles perro, are perro and perro yeah you can do it perro. i can't do it but it was really interesting because one issue that came up with ours specifically is that there are many people who are native speakers of english who cannot pronounce r sounds anyway and they say it more like a w and your youngest child is an example of that <laughs> <laughs> somebody who says blaiva instead of oh, driver Dwyver, yeah. and then there's a very soft r sound in english so i'm not an Irish show I, I say error. error you have that AH sound instead of an ER at the end these are the complexities in a tiny part of one human language. The things that this film are dealing with are pretty phenomenal. Now, of course, we're all familiar with French-speaking people struggling with the TH exactly. sound. Exactly. Somebody gave the example today that in Spanish, Spanish, a TH sound is used for C and Z in a lot of letter combinations. But it's always a soft, it's always a th rather than a th, yeah, isn't it's it? Soft. It's a softer it's, version. It's, it's similar to a TH Sound. It's yeah. how we understand Breath when we are learning it. But rather than theatre. Well, there are a lot of Spanish speakers who struggle with that harder TH sound that we make in English. It's really enlightening and it's fascinating as well to work with people who are not using Roman type, you know, whose languages are Arabic yeah. or Oriental Asian languages as well as Chinese and 
Japanese people in the class. We use different symbols for the signs of words. And it's not like the symbols that we use for the noises that we make actually uniformly correspond to those noises. There's about as many exceptions as there are. That's, that was um, a whole other discussion we had today as well, is that English is not phonetic, but Spanish is largely phonetic. So you've got these varied complications. So how do you then deal with a totally different way of communicating from outside mm. of your world? Is death process, I think. There's something mm. poetic about that because it's imperfect English, but it means so much as well. I think that's probably most things that we wanted to say. Right, so maybe what we should we should introduce a new thing to these recordings and we should establish what we're going to look at next time. I don't think it works like that because this was unplanned, so I'm happy. Because okay. I so don't know what order these are going to come out in. For the record then, next time we're going to be doing it as spontaneously as we did it this time. The idea is that I'll mix it up. If this becomes a podcast, it's not just going to be Paula and Andrew have a chat about a film they've just watched. It's going to be different <laughs> you, things. You mean there aren't? There isn't an audience Is hungry for this? Did I not warn you? That there isn't There's already be... 2,000 podcasts which are basically There's the same thing. There's going to be weeks where it's maybe just me doing something and there's going to be times when, because I'm doing the chats with Sandra about things as well, so I might use some of those. It's like sometimes Mark appears without Simon and sometimes... That doesn't happen. Yeah, that's what you're suggesting. That you're suggesting the sacrilege I think that, that happened once that Simon did it without Mark and... Cause it, it was nearly a divorce Because it can be, what is it, Sanjeev and... Sanjeev and James, or Sanjeev mm. with Robbie, or... Robbie. Al Murray has done it a few times. Edith Bowman does it sometimes. Zoe mm. Ball used to do it. Mm. Edith Bowman's great. It's really brilliant when she and Robbie do it, because it goes all Scottish. Last time Edith did it, it was with Clarice Lochrey. She's quite a new person. She's done it twice now, and she's very young. A little whippersnapper in her 20s, and she does very well she holds her own you know so you can switch the two of them for two other people yeah it was nice to have two women finally in the very long life of that show did they wit it it was pretty clipped actually it was <laughs> about 20 minutes shorter than it usually is and it was incredibly informative and it was a very good show then i hate to say this but briefly it would not have been with attainment but it? you can't put your baby to sleep there's tiny it wittery bits but it's just more economical but you see the intros and outros with Marcus Simon are so long partly because people send them stuff yeah. so they'll send like okay so this week I'm a sound person I'm this uh, music person and I've knocked together this electronic track purely on Mark's noises <laughs> You know, when you get this piece of music that's made just from Mark. Because he does tend to go, hmm. oh, no, hang on, no, I'm thinking noises. of Simon's noises. Now, what are Mark's noises? Well, he tries not to make his noises because he's not allowed to make them at home, so he tries not to make them on the radio as well. Poor Mark, he's so oppressed. <laughs> None of this oh. goes in, by the way. None of this mm-hmm. goes in the final cut okay, of our sure. stuff. Yeah, I took right. all the Mark and Simon out <laughs> from the last one because it yeah. was just wittering on about two middle-aged men and who needs any more of that in the world? <laughs> <laughs> just for it's on the record, I want to propose that next time, or at least another time, you and I watch a faith film. Mm, I, I know. get angry. I know. I, know. Well, I, know. Well, I want to do a completely different flavour of recording where we'll have just watched something which is pure, unadulterated Jesus. And to just let fly and see what happens. That's just going to make me really angry. Well, it's such is like, the life It's of... probably one that if we put it out, it wouldn't go out until we're established because we need to win some yeah. friends. Because I'm going to do a lot of recent faith films on a new module that I'm teaching uh-huh. next year. I've got a lot of watching of them probably over the course of the summer. It's just, I've seen I... some already. Yeah. But I want to bag a few more. And we might have and... to rewatch some. The thing is, is that I just sort of want to go into MST3K mode. I just want to riff them the whole time well, and throw things at them. Let's do that. Have you ever seen The Passion of the Christ? We could just start there. Yeah, I've never seen it. We could do this. But you <laughs> see, then I have to compromise on some things because it's directed by Mel Gibson and I do not want to give 
that Gaia platform because there's a tension here between dealing with cultural production, dealing with cultural products in an analytical way, but I also feel very strongly about privileging those who have been underprivileged in terms of representation. Like, I'd rather watch Belle a hundred times and gush about that film mm-hmm. than watch anything to do with Mel Gibson ever again. Uh, okay. And I'm a, I was a massive Lethal Weapon fan, so that's difficult for me to say. You like seeing that man in pain? <laughs> I like him that's all putting he does his and... dislocated shoulder back in. Yeah, making that <laughs> noise that he makes when he's in pain. Pretending to be in pain. All right, well, let's not watch a mainstream play film then. Let's watch one of the well, niche ones they today. They are making a sequel, aren't they? Of Passion of the... <laughs> I, don't know. I mean, maybe it's going to be what Family Guy predicted and it'll be like the action movie version. Sorry, it's Chris Tucker. Well, um, I, <laughs> I, I watched a trailer today for a 1987 film called Court. Awful trailer for an awful film. And it was a film produced by a production company called Worldwide Productions. Uh-huh. Which was founded by Billy Graham in the 1950s. Oh, he's just died as well. Yeah, and it was founded to do faith filmmaking. Mm. And it's still making films now. Just I could tell from the trailer that Would it was just BC? awfully active. This is the, sorry, go ahead. Now, however, there are some faith films coming out that are not as awful in the way that they're acted. Which is worrying. And scripted. There's a Christian filmmaking industry in the US it's that getting is getting good. its shit together. And I want to know what it's doing. The problem with that, then, is you give a credence by giving it a platform yeah. and you give them money by having to purchase the films. I think there's something to be said for giving somebody a platform in order to show that they have have bad ideas and I mean bad both in the sense of unevidenced and immoral as long as it's completely filtered through us describing it but then you you, you risk a liberal backlash of everybody's entitled to their opinion indeed they are just as we are entitled to point out that their opinion is based on mistakes and includes immoral prescriptions and just as they are to do about anything we might say yeah. should it happen to include mistakes and or immoral prescriptions you're a bit braver than me about putting that out there as overtly but then you have the confidence of a middle class white man uh, yeah I store it entirely in my penis it's like you know that bit in <laughs> intertextuality it's like that bit in the second Austin Powers film when he's frozen somebody drills through the ice and removes his mojo and it's actually like in a vial of kind of funky liquid that looks like a a lava lamp (laughs) it's the same thing my confidence is stored within my my John Thomas If you find this episode informative, useful or even enjoyable, please share it and subscribe to the podcast so you never miss new instalments. Many thanks to those of you who do. The podcast is free and I work freelance. If you can help financially with a regular payment to patreon.com forward slash PEA Blair, that would be greatly appreciated. Payments are in US dollars, so do check out exchange rates that are relevant to you. For example, when recording this, the British pound is fluctuating around the 70 pence to the dollar mark so a two dollar subscription should cost no more than one pound fifty at this rate. I'm also accepting one-off donations to paypal.me forward slash PEA Blair to save up for a much needed new laptop to continue this work to a higher standard. Any help in making arts and humanities education accessible in a world increasingly driven by screen and media cultures is gratefully received and potentially benefits us all. Thanks and catch you next time.